listening to Mile High Insiders with Nick Kendall and Luke Patterson. Head on over to milehighhuddle.com for all things Broncos. Now, it's time to find out what's going on behind the walls of UC Health Training Center. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mile High Insiders, giving it a second to breathe there, as Chad would say. I am Nick Kendall, along with Luke Patterson. Luke, it's been two shows since we've hooked up last. I know that I've missed a couple of shows there for a bit. Uh, with moved from the, or Iowa City to the Quad Cities. You had your daughter's birthday last week. How'd that go? Uh, yeah, I had daughter's birthday two weeks ago. Little girl turned seven, and then five-year wedding anniversary with my wife right. last weekend. So, yeah, we've been mixing it up, doing different shows. Things have been awesome. But um, I texted you really late last night saying, dude, let's bring it tomorrow. I can't wait to talk to you. It's been a while. So I'm pumped, man. I'm, t- I'm pumped to talk Broncos because it seems like offensive line is uh, the talk of the town right now in Broncos country. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fun to be back. And as you guys can see, uh, I actually have stuff in that empty bookshelf behind me now. I've been going through – sorry, we got the mirror effect here. I've uh, been going through old stuff, packing up before the wife and I move out to Seattle. I guess we announced that last week. So going through a bunch of stuff, and I just got a bunch of Bronco memorabilia and stuff from my childhood and just collected. So I'm like, you know what? Toss it up there. That way nobody can complain and say, empty bookshelf, no more. So, guys, this is the Mile High Insiders Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on this fine Saturday evening. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Luke Patterson LP and myself at Nick Kendall MHH. Subscribe to our show wherever, wherever you listen to these podcasts and leave us a rating. Uh, the biggest thing for us, especially for YouTube, if you're listening on YouTube and you're not a subscriber right now, make sure you do that. Like, subscribe, share. It can help us reach so many new listeners. And it's if you're, if you're listening on YouTube and you're not subscribed, why not? Let us know what we can do to get you subscribed. We want you. So that way, when our shows go live, you get that ping. You know we're going. And it's not just our show. It's the Building the Broncos podcast. It's Dub Valley Deep Divers. It's the Huddle Up podcast. So make sure you subscribe. Also, don't miss all of our great off-season content at milehighhuddle.com, which is an affiliate of Sports Illustrated, the, the great and well-known Sports Illustrated. So this is the Overtime Podcast Network. Uh, Luke. Offensive line today, that is the the talk of the town, and obviously it's been, I mean, besides quarterback, it's been the talk of the town for probably the last three, four years, ever since Peyton Manning left. I mean, the offensive line, I think there's something to be said about the offensive line where, like, sometimes with defense, you don't, if somebody misses an assignment, you, the quarterback or the, or the other team has to be good enough to exploit that on defense, but when the offensive line messes up, it's really easy to see that guy messes up. And it only takes once per game for them to really just scrub. They got to be perfect throughout the entire game. And when they don't, it's, uh, I guess, the Boo Birds come to town. And we found that out uh, watching the Broncos the past few seasons. Yeah, offensive line has been a nightmare for the Denver Broncos, specifically at the right tackle position, and I would even argue the left tackle position. Now, I think Broncos country can breathe a sigh of relief that they know Garrett Bowles is at least coming back. Unlike Jawan James, he did have his reasons. You have to respect that. Moving forward, though, um, it was a huge week for the Broncos. They had Dalton Reisner talk. He spoke about possibly changing a couple positions. I know we'll get into that a little bit later in the show, but you're exactly right. The offensive line, those five guys have to be so well connected. And that's something Reisner spoke about this week. And Lance Anderson wrote about it at milehighhuddle.com talking about those comments of Dalton Reisner saying, look, it's my responsibility to know Lloyd Cushenberry's responsibilities as the starting center. If I had to move to center, I need to pride myself on all of the these type of versatility options, just like Graham Glasgow, another guy that you and I have been pounding the table saying, we're so excited that Graham Glasgow is in the house. So offensive line is huge. I can't wait to get a part of it, man. And and the big uglies, you hardly ever talk about them, but in Broncos country, it's all anyone's talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's been an issue for many years. I mean, when was the last time you felt good about the Broncos offensive line overall? I, for me, my mind comes back to the year. It might've even been Clady's rookie season or second year when they had Clady, they had Ryan Harris and they had Chris Cooper. And that trio was amongst the best in the NFL that season. And they were pretty darn good. Granted, Mike Shanahan offense helped uh, Jay Cutler, who was showing promise at that point, uh, the ability to escape the pocket. But ever since then, it's been, it's been an issue. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it just goes to show you that uh, it's, it's hard to find a quality offensive lineman now. And you see it trickling down from the college level. I know you and I are constantly looking at the next players available. You've already started your work. I know you have. Um, I'm waiting a little bit towards December and January, but you're seeing – quality offensive linemen come out into the NFL draft less and less now. And uh, a lot of that can be argued, well, it's a passing offense, so you're not quite sure what you're getting. If it's a one, two-step drop uh, or three or five-step drop, you're getting rid of the ball in roughly one to two seconds. So it's hard to hard to judge some of the offensive line play coming out of college and whether or not it's going to transition. Case in point, look at Garrett Bowles. Now, he did have his holding penalties and his issues there, but something Dalton Reisner talked about this week was saying Mike Munchak is going to you know, cover up a lot of those warts. And uh, I think he definitely supported Garrett Bowles and had his back, and nobody should be surprised there. But for me, there were some things that he didn't say about Garrett Bowles. Like, you know, Dalton Reisner said he's working his butt off, you know, but he didn't quite say that about Garrett Bowles. Um, he said you're going to see a player similar to the last five games of last season. Well, that's okay, but I still want better. So sometimes it's the things they're not saying that I try to pick up on. And this isn't a Garrett Bowles podcast bash, but for me, we're talking about the tackles because you've got your three interior guys already locked up. So it is what it is with Jawan James, except it move forward. But now we've got a young guy in the, well, not a young guy, I guess an old, old dog in the building today. And, and, you know, DeMar Dotson, I guess is how you pronounce his last name. And to be quite frankly with you, Nick, I don't, I don't know much about this cat. I know that he was undrafted. He's, he's right tackle, can play left tackle. He's 6'9", 315 pounds. Try to look up some film on him. That's hard to find. You got to go a little bit way back in the archives. But uh, this changes some stuff for the offensive line. You've got a couple offensive linemen that are versatile. So I'm really looking forward to seeing if Mike Munchak is going to experiment with several pieces on the O-line. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me in bringing in Dotson is that, A, he's not going to be very expensive. You know, a lot of people, the Broncos, I think, have the fourth most cap space after the Juwan James opting out. But there's not, I mean, you don't want to just spend money to spend money. And you're going to have to pay him now next year. The cap is uh, questionable next season. So just spending money to spend money is probably not the option. Dotson comes in in that sweet range. I'm guessing he's going to be about four or five million for one year. It's kind of that Evan Mathis kind of deal. We were right. getting that journeyman. Uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, there's a chance maybe he doesn't even make a team or he gets injured, but you're still getting that depth. And I think that's the most important thing. And also, I think it's very important. Dotson, I believe, will be right tackle only. I think this does make left tackle a little bit more of a competition where Garrett Bowles should feel pressure. Uh, Wilkinson obviously struggled last year. I think on tape, from what I could assess, I would say Garrett Bowles is the better player, but Garrett Bowles cannot rest on his laurels now. I mean, Wilkinson, right. they have always talk about him being more left tackle than right tackle. Uh, we'll see about that there. So I think that's good. I mean, you're going to need six, seven, eight offensive linemen throughout a season anyway. And after the Broncos tackles the top two tackles, especially with Wilkinson coming off pup, uh, you know, Jake Rogers, uh, I mean, after that, who Calvin Anderson, I mean, mm-hmm. it's scary after that. It's really scary. So I think the biggest thing is the depth and the ability to go multiple directions, but also just potentially Garrett Bowles feeling a little bit of heat on his rump from Wilkinson at the left tackle position, which I think is really important for him. I like that you bring that up a lot because to me that signals, you know, maybe Dotson, they want to see what he can do. And, you know, bless him, he's 34 years old. He's towards the end of his career. But if they could get by with it, because they've got to figure this out and they've got to figure it out now, it's something that they didn't plan for. So, um, yeah, I like that. I like that maybe Dotson's going to be in the run for right tackle. One of the biggest concerns for me when everybody's talking about their feelings and being mad of Jawan James and all that other stuff, I think about Elijah Wilkinson. Now, a lot of folks say, well, he locked up the, a starting position now, so the guy should feel relief. Not at all. I think the guy would be frustrated. I would argue he's frustrated because he's been preparing again another year for the left tackle position, and he's being thrown in at a right tackle position where, yeah, he was competent, but man, it, he had his own troubles at right tackle position too i mean make no bones about it it's just one of those deals where you can't just throw together a makeshift offensive line i like the idea of a swing tackle being able to come in this cat's got some injuries to him and dotson from tampa bay was an undrafted guy going all the way back to 2009 i mean i graduated high school in 2009 so he's an old dog um but i like the move that he's here He's in the building, he's taking his tests, and uh, we're all just kind of waiting on pins and needles. But all signs, Nick, seem to indicate that the Broncos are going to sign this cat, right? 
Yeah, that's what it does seem like. But uh, before we get too long down this track here, let's get to the chat real quick, see what's going on. Say hello to some folks. We got James Campbell in the house, Charlie Campbell, Dennis Elliott, Terry Randall. Uh, good job uh, last Thursday, Terry. That yeah, was nice. Strong Robert work. Skinner. Uh, got a good number of people here. Let me see who else. Stu McPeak, Stu. You take down your uh, Seattle picture as soon as I announce that I'm moving there. What's up with that? I think he's trying to hide from me. Uh, Jerry Holen coming in here. Looks like he's wearing the Drew Lock jersey, too. That's nice, Jerry. Uh, Kristen Mar- Marano. Thanks for joining us, Kristen. I'm from hey, Facebook. Uh, so, yeah, we got oh, Dylan Von Ar- Dylan Von Arks coming in. Glenn Hauser. Oh, man, we got a lot of familiar faces here. Some that I don't recognize as well. Uh, Jolene. Also coming in, my Twitter feed always pauses about three seconds, so Facebook it is. Hey, Jolien, we appreciate you uh, trudging through it with us to figure out the best way to listen to us. And we got a super chat coming in. Uh, David Kilgore, David, how you doing today? Do you guys see a really good fit, or do you guys see a really good first-round talent at right tackle in the 2001 draft, or does Denver is Denver getting a free agency in for right tackle? I think that you can't really think about the exact direction you're going to go in the first round. You have to have multiple options. And that will depend on what happens in the draft. So you have guys like potentially, uh, let me see, uh, David Bakatiari might be a free agent. Actually, they talked about the contract with him. Uh, There's Andre Villanueva, who obviously Munchak has experience with. Uh, There's some other ones as well. David Bakatiari also played for uh, CU. So maybe there's a homecoming at minute there. You don't don't know. The Broncos are stuck with Juwan James next year, just how the contract is. Uh, It's going to be rolled over. He's going to be a Bronco in 2021. I guess the positive in that regard is that you're not set up where you're going to have to replace both tackles uh, because if you lose Garrett Bowles next season, which, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but you do have Juwan James. I guess he's just a lottery ticket at this point, but you don't have to try to replace both at the same time. So, I mean, first you're going to go through the draft or first you're going to go through free agency, see if you can patch those holes there. And then you just let the draft come to you. That's what the good teams do. You don't want to, be stuck in any singular position in the draft. Even though I was preaching for wide receiver at this point a year ago, it was just because how many options that looked good in the first round for the Broncos. So uh, obviously then turned out that way, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy, CD lamb, all first rounds, all, all in range for the Broncos. So it'll definitely be interesting there. Yeah, it's a good question, David. And that tells me that you're a football nut, just like us, because you're constantly looking forward to the next draft. And we love the draft so much. Uh, Nick's already into it. I wait a little bit. But I don't know that many offensive tackle prospects, just to be completely honest with you. That being said, it's about fixing, get a Band-Aid now for offensive tackle. You might have one that can fill the need, but maybe you have a gem in this old dog. Maybe he can make it with Elijah Wilkinson. Maybe, you know, sometimes it takes that swing tackle to make a season work. And guys are, you know, that's a very important position. I know it can be scoffed at as, you know, you're not a starting offensive lineman or starting tackle, but you're very much so a rotational player as soon as there's an injury. So we got Chad coming in here. Uh, If Dotson is signed as an eight-year starting right tackle, for what reason would the Broncos keep Elijah Wilkinson penciled in? Rock on men, much love, MHH. Uh, Thank you, Chad. I I don't think they would keep him penciled in, but as that sixth guy who can play both tackle positions and both guard positions, I mean, it's just the reality of it, especially given the circumstance of the public health crisis we're in right now. Uh, You're probably going to end up seeing Elijah Wilkinson at some point, uh, whether it be because of injury or sickness. So having that depth, I think, is extremely important in that regard, but more than it's ever been, especially with a weird abbreviated offseason. I mean, you could see some soft tissue injuries cropping up. So uh, I don't know about having him penciled in unless he takes the job from Garrett Bowles, which, I mean, could happen. Uh, But I think that, you know, having him as that super sub sixth guy, that's super important. There's a lot of value to that. And, you know, don't just let the, you know, the NBC Sunday Night Football where they announce the starters. That's always great. But. The guys on the bench, especially for sixth, seventh guy on the offensive line, very valuable. You're going to need them. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Elijah Wilkinson, one thing with Elijah Wilkinson, I constantly wonder. People often say Mike Munchak's got to be able to coach up Garrett Bowles, and Garrett's got to be able to receive that. Well, last time I checked, Elijah Wilkinson is very coachable, and coachable so much so that he's able to be versatile. So why couldn't Elijah Wilkinson come in and compete for that starting left tackle position? I don't think it's probable that he will start, but I think he could give Garrett Bowles a run for his money. Um, I think he's also going to be taking reps at the right tackle position. They're going to be moving him all over, and I I think Dotson's the same way. They're going to try to figure out, you know, what do we do? God forbid Garrett Bowles gets hurt. You know, the guys say what you want about him. 
he's been sort of an Iron Man. I mean, I know he got carted off and had a what what seemed to be a scary injury, and thank goodness it wasn't. But the guy's out there, and that's what Fangio said last year too. And for what it's worth, he's right. He's been training. He's been working out. I can make fun of his music video all day. But the fact of the matter is the guy is dedicated to his team. I just hope he's dedicated to himself because he's athletic. He's got the tools. I want him to put it together. Maybe he can under Mike Munchak. But you know what? Elijah Wilkinson can definitely respond to coaching under Mike Munchak as well. You hear him in some of these offseason interviews. He sounds mad. He sounds mean. He's already talking as if he's the starting left tackle. So I like it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. We got Stu coming in. Oop, sorry, we missed that one. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, use the force loop depth on OL is key. Terry could not agree more. Um, you, we Terry. also got Stu McPeak coming in here. Uh, Stu, really interested to hear from you both after having reviewed some tape on Dotson. Uh, Dotson, big, long, I think a better pass protector than a run protector. Uh, I'm curious how much of his struggles on tape are due to scheme and quarterback. Obviously, those are big things for any single offensive lineman. Offensive linemen tend to take more blame than they probably sh- should in today's league because, again, it's obvious when they make a mistake. Uh, but Jameis Winston holds onto the ball a lot in the pocket <laughs> um, and tries to throw the ball down the field into stupid windows. I mean, what did he do? Did he throw 40 in 40 last year? 40 touchdowns, 40 interceptions? Yeah, he was, he was like the 30 for 30 guy. You know, yeah. It's, just, it's Yeah, absolutely. And for what it's worth, I'm going to you know rag on Dotson just a little bit as a welcome to Broncos country if they do, in fact, sign him, which maybe we get that news tomorrow, pending test results, physical and other tests. Uh, you could use your mind to fill in that that other test brain teaser there. But, uh, you know, as you look at it, he said Jameis Winston. He stuck up for his quarterback. He said Winston was his guy, but you're exactly right. You look at that kick step for me, and he's definitely lost a couple steps. Uh, he can get flagged for holding, had to go deep in the archives to try to find some film on this cat. It's not you can't just pull it up on YouTube, you know, DeMar Dotson highlights and start watching these clips like you can these 2019, 2020 draft picks. Game um, pass. Yeah, yeah. You got to go back into Game Pass. You got to go in the archives. He's been a Tampa Bay Buck his whole career. You know, I think he competed with Jeremy uh, True Blood or Young Blood or something like True that. For, yeah, for a little bit. And then there was another offensive tackle before they swung him from right to left. And that's another good opportunity for me to. Chad Jensen just wrote up an awesome article on a little bit of DeMar Dotson's history on at milehighhuddle.com. So please go check that out and check out the Twitter at milehighhuddle. I got some swag I'm going to talk about. I finally got me some some hat. Uh, I was complaining to Chad about it this morning, and he's like, dude, check your mailbox. It should have been there last week. So I finally decided to check my mail. Uh, I got my trucker trucker hat. So you guys get your swag on and come over and support the, uh, the Mile High Huddle crew. We've got Awesome podcast, awesome writers, awesome staff that are just constantly on the Broncos beat. So I want to say yeah. a huge, huge thank you to Chad. Appreciate my hat. I'm looking good, baby. Looking good. And coming back to uh, Dotson here, I think another thing that's really important to assess with him, I only touched on it for a second, uh, but that Bruce Arians offense, it's kind of air raid before it's air raid. It's air Coriel technically, but they are pushing that ball down the field constantly. Ooh, uh, let me see. Is that from the other? Is that from the other room? <laughs> I think I think I know that young lady. This is my lovely wife Gina, who listens to our show every single week. Thank you very much. Love the hat, Luke. Uh, she Happy loved the chat. Yeah, thank thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Broncos country is a state of being in our household too. You know, so we just go with the not a geographical location because that's exactly right. You can be anywhere and be a Broncos fan. So I appreciate that, Gina. Thanks, John. Wanna beast on the ones and twos, checking that out for me. So no, you're exactly right, man. Dotson Dotson's got some troubles. He's got some concerns, but I think he's worth a look. I mean, again, it's just getting depth. And from what I saw from Jake Rogers last year, it did not look good. Uh so that was a concerning part of it. But again, and, Bruce Arians offense, they he leaves the tackles on an island. It's very much attacking the ball down the field. And when you do that, so many deep shots, you're leaving the tackles vulnerable. So I and, think with Dotson, his length, even if he's lost his depth, he's so long, and yeah. you're going to have a little bit more quick passing here. Drew Locks takes quick dropbacks. Uh, yeah. Patrick, Pat Shermer, it's not as conservative as Scangarello, but it is still a West Coast offense where they are going to have some timing stuff, some shorter stuff. So I think you can protect the tackles in that regard. It just feels better to have a more known quantity there along with Wilkinson coming off pup and Garrett Bowles being what he is at this point. 
I like that you brought up his length because you're exactly right. The dude's six foot nine, 315 pounds. So he's a bruiser and he's not a sloppy 315 pounds. He's an offensive tackle, solid 315 pounds. So uh, I, I like it. Just real quick off the top of my head, they have two roster slots available, right? With Jeff Hireman and Jawan James right now or, and Maybe Kyle another- Pucko. I'm not sure because they have to get it down. I know if due to the state of public health right now, some teams are going to get it lower, right? Like yeah. I don't think they have to get it. I think they can get down to 80, but they don't have to. Uh, maybe Hunter, if you can, get us, yeah, if yeah. you can help us with that a little bit, because I'm wondering that right now, because we know, you know, Hireman was was cut almost two weeks ago. Um, you're able to see what it looks like with these players that are opting out. So I'm wondering just how many spots are available for the Broncos right Becco now. Opted out too. Yeah, so it could be two to three slots. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, to bring in an, yeah, to bring in an offensive tackle and take a look at him, I think it's definitely worth it. And, uh, you know, I think right now this is why Mike Munchak was hired. Um, he's got to make a quick decision. You know, he's he knows this cat. Mike Munchak watches film of all the offensive linemen, not just the Denver Broncos. So he knows the offensive tackles. And if he's saying it's it's worth worth it and uh, worth a try, let's do it. Yeah. And again, I'm not expecting him to come in and be great. But if he can just, you know, provide depth and be competent for $4 million in one year, that's what good teams do. It's those quiet moves. It's not a splash, but it is a ripple. And those can those can add up. So we got Richard Pasha coming in here. Uh, Richard, good to see you. I haven't seen you before. He says, hey, guys, first live pod. I've made it in a while. Richard, thanks for joining us today. We really do appreciate that. Thank you, Richard. I would love, I would love to see OA go get Reisner's old teammate, Scott France, to compete at right tackle. I think he deserves an NFL opportunity. Thought. Uh, honestly, I'm surprised that Scott France is uh, not picked up. I thought he was pretty good. I thought I think he's more of a interior player. I don't think he has the athleticism. He's not a dancing bear by any means. That being said, and it's, this is I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much. Um, Scott France is uh, he might have there might be some issues with him in the locker room for some people because he is a I mean he's gay let's just call it let's not dance around it he's gay and I know that sometimes that can be an issue uh for some people in the locker rooms and I mean even you know I don't want to go down a a PC narrative here but in some locker rooms for some people that's a problem so maybe that's a reason he's not signed right now but I think his tape definitely warrants a chance to make an NFL roster at the very least yeah thanks Rich that's a that's a real I started smiling because I hadn't thought about I hadn't thought about that. That's a really interesting thought. I'm surprised he's available also. I agree with you. Uh, it's hard for him to get his feet underneath some of that weight sometimes. And, you know, although I'd love a Reisner reunion, just like you're seeing Alberto and Drew Locke, um, it just kind of makes me wonder, you know, where things are at, what it's like, you know, even the schematics of getting guys in and out of Denver, trying to get these tests done, stuff like that. Um, they've got to make decisions on whether or not those things are worth it because it's not as easy as it once was to just fly out a player and have a player work out and then sign them. So I think sometimes you can go a little bit deeper. Don't know what the practice squad situation would look like. I mean, right now we're just trying to fix, fix, uh, focus on an active roster. So I like it, Rich. I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, that was a great question. I mean, you want to see college teammates come together in the NFL if they're good players. And sometimes you do see that. It's very rare, but sometimes you do see it. Um, love the love the question, Rich. Thank you for tuning in, pal. Yeah, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you again on some more live shows. Let me get a little bit more of that, that background there. I can never get the uh, – because it's flipped for us. But uh, we got Manny Weiss coming in here. Uh, how strong do you guys think the linebacker core will be? I think that the Broncos linebacking core is not going to be – anything that is competing for the top units in the NFL. It's not going to be in the top five, but I think that as long as they stay healthy, they should be good enough. You know, I, there are going to be times where, especially in this division, when you have so many good tight ends that they're going to go against, uh, there are going to be times where the linebackers are going to look not great because they get schemed up and guess what? The other team takes advantage of it. There's not really that speed coverage guy that a lot of great linebacking units have. But Todd Davis is steady Eddie. I mean, he doesn't mess up very often. He The last year, he was one of the, I think, five linebackers who played 100 snaps in the slot, which Todd Davis, bless his heart, he's not a coverage linebacker. But he went out there, he executed as, as he could, and he's really good in the box. He's also the the play caller, uh, not the play caller, but the uh, the signal caller of the defense, mm-hmm. the green dot. So very smart player, doesn't make many mistakes, not missing many tackles. And then out A.J. Johnson, Alexander Johnson, a lot of energy, very good in the red zone, has that length, uh, man, just tenacious. 
again, not really a coverage guy though, but uses that length a little bit to help cover some of that up. But I think they should be fine. It's it's a position where if there's a three down linebacker next year that you love in the first round of the draft or somebody that you want to pay to take you over to the top and move on from Todd Davis because he is good, good and solid, but he's not really a difference maker, then you can do that. But overall, I think linebacking course should be fine. Manny, that's a really good question. Appreciate your support, and I like that Bronco flag that you got in the background there. That's super cool. Nick and I were talking about all kinds of gear. Nick's wearing a cool old shirt right now, so I immediately noticed uh, your flag. That's awesome, Manny. I appreciate the support, brother. Um, Yeah, I I honestly think this is a huge concern for the Denver Broncos Mm -hmm. linebacking core. I think that if they can be average, that's a win for the Denver Broncos. I don't think that they're – severely in trouble but i think that they're gonna have to scrape to get by because of those those passing darn tight ends they just they they plague the denver broncos linebacking core they really do and you know it, it's one of those things where the linebacking position is changing you're not getting the al wilson zach thomas's of the world the brian Erlackers. you know you, you got to get some guys that are a little bit leaner that that linebacker safety hybrid you know that can try to cover tight ends can fill the safety role, linebacker role a little bit. So it's it's an evolutionary position right now, and it seems like the Broncos have the old-school linebackers, you know, and I'm talking about Alexander Johnson. And, you know, he, he's got the dinosaur dance. It's the coolest thing ever, but he can't cover at all, and that drives me nuts because it's not that he doesn't want to. It's that he just doesn't have that ability. Um, he is going to play his heart out for you, and same with Josie Jewell, but gosh darn it, you can't coach speed. So <laughs> I think uh, I think it could be – uh-oh, the sheriff is down. I know. Just that, that was like, it's very uh, reminiscent of the uh, 2000. I don't think – and you know what he said? I was making fun of Alexander Johnson's dinosaur dance, and that's when it happened. So maybe i got to watch my mouth when, when 18 is in the background there. But, I heard something well, moving. What the heck is going on? <laughs> yeah, no, man, I think that's a good question. I think the Broncos would be happy if they could be average. I'm curious to see what Watson's going to do, the CSU kid. Um, he seemed like a, a – a project linebacker to me for a couple of years now. I think Vic has shown some interest in him. I don't know how much time Vic's been able to work with him or craft him just because time is something that's very precious right now with these guys and trying to even get time with the starters. So uh hope to be average at best from the linebacking core for the Broncos. There are just one thing you said. I, I can't let it go. I'm sorry. I got a, I grew up Eastern Iowa. So I know a good about a good bit about the bears. Brian Urlacher was a phenomenal coverage linebacker. He actually played safety at college and then moved to linebacker in the NFL because he was such a freak athlete. I mean, 6'4", 250 pounds, and he moved like that. He was able to drop essentially from the middle linebacker. You're right, but he was the only one, right? I mean, the only, like, big dude that can really cover. I mean, Lawrence Taylor, you know, he's a pass rusher, linebacker. Rusher. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not going to be seeing him. So, yeah, uh, yeah you're right. I, I take that back. Just give me an Brian example, I'm like – Brian Erlacher was a safety in college. Like you literally said, we need the safety linebacker hybrids. I'm like, that was what, that was the big selling point for Erlacher. And he came in and could play that Tampa two where he could drop so far back from that linebacker position. He was essentially the midfield safety because he was such an athletic freak back there. But anyway, that was just like, ah, we got to get that one right. We're not going to disrespect <laughs> Erlacher like that. He's too good. All my it's friends the, from high school the- would come beat me up. It's the barbed wire tattoo thing. I just can't get past the hair plugs I'm good with. It's just the, the hair I just can't get past, you know, the, the barbed wire tattoo. No, I take it back. You're right. He was a good coverage linebacker. I guess I was just thinking, like, when I think of Erlacher, I think of that power, that just bulky classic linebacker thoroughbred that you wanted in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, it just doesn't seem like we're that size of linebackers right now. Even edge rushers are getting leaner and longer. And you look at the Bosa brothers. So I take it back. Any Chicago Bears fans, if you're here, get out. This is a Broncos country only. Uh, Nick, take it easy. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. That's okay. I just was like, oh, that one. (laughs) That's not not bringing true. Zach Thomas is the one that brings – very true for me where box player, he would just get annihilated in today's NFL. So yep. don't tell that to Dolphins Twitter that people bring that up and they just absolutely lose their minds. Uh, we got Larry Vaughn coming in. Larry, I haven't seen you before. It looks like a nice beer you're rocking there. Uh, could we see, could we release James next season without any kind of violations due to him opting out the season? Uh, no, the Broncos could not. Uh, I guess violation is the wrong word. They could move on from him. That poster is just going to come down. It's just like Peyton Manning at the end of the career. I can just hear it. Uh, but oh, um, oh, you hear that? <laughs> I might make fun of Brian Urlacher, but he's he's dropping Peyton. So man, I mean, Peyton, 
we saw South Payton. Unfortunately, guys, I'm I've been to seven Bronco games in my life. I'm zero and seven, and I saw that game where Peyton Manning got. I think it was his last game, and after that, he just totally fell off. It was that game in 2014 against the St. Louis Rams, and that was the yeah. game where Emmanuel Sanders got lit up and had the concussion, and they lost to the horrible Rams. So I, I'm zero and seven, guys. It's just it's not great. I need to just pay me to go not go to the games. Um, but Broncos releasing James. Unfortunately, the 2020 contract just kicks over to 2021. So the way that his contract is set up, you just have to eat so much dead money to move on from him. It makes more sense just to have the lottery ticket and hope it works out, but not depend on yeah. it, I guess is a way to look at it. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, Larry. I appreciate you tuning in. Love the Broncos gear. You're rocking as well, man. That's awesome. It's awesome to see so many people wearing Broncos gear. Um, you're stuck with him. That's just the way it is. And I don't know if you're Jawan James, he just can't get on the field, really. So maybe he doesn't even play next year. Maybe he quits football altogether. I don't know. Um, hard to guess. But basically, you know, in a nutshell, he's going to get between 150, well, 150 or 350K. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but that designation of high versus low risk will be uh, ultimately determined by the NFLPA. I believe so. Yeah, so we have yet to hear kind of how that's working. We know that these guys are opting out right now, and the season hasn't quite started yet, even though they're – well, I guess, yeah, they'd be getting paid every two weeks or every week right now, right? They're in training yeah. camp, so they should be getting yeah. weekly paychecks. So I'm curious to see when those designations start coming, and I think as soon as they're reported, you're going to see it in mass, what guys are getting, 150 or 350. And be ready for that, Broncos country. Guys are going to be – and gals are going to be upset that Juwan James is getting anything at all. But you know what? It was his right. We got to respect that, and we got to move on. But something I heard from a member of Broncos country on Twitter, and I, I'm forgetting the username right now. It's going to eat me up. But this could be a rallying cry. For the Broncos, this can bring some some teams together. If hey, I know you're here for me, I'm here for you. We're here for one goal. You don't see any coaches opting out right now. I see these guys running wind sprints, Nick. I see the offensive line, Graham Glasgow, Dalton Reisner, saying they're leaders of the team. Um, it got it kind of has this old school feel to me, and I like it. I really like it. Yeah, I mean, Vic Fangio kind of brought that last year. Also, Vic's looking good. I know he lost that weight. Vic's looking great. So uh, good for Vic, man, taking taking charge of his own personal health. Uh, we got Kevin Peterson coming in here also. Kevin, good to see you. What's up, fellas? Glad I made it to the pod tonight. Kevin, we're glad you made it here with us. And also, nice picture of you and Dalton Reisner there. Thanks, also, Kevin. I saw Eclipse Stormborn is with us. Hey, how you doing, Eclipse? Hey. Good to see you here today. Apologize for your tardiness. Hey, just don't let it happen again. No, I'm Never. just kidding. We appreciate nice you. Clips. We appreciate you coming on here. And I saw, I think it was Buana, he says, talking about Watson and Hollins, kind of the designation of outside linebacker or inside linebacker versus edge rusher. And I think that versatility is key. But really, for them to make the team, I think the biggest uh, marker for them will be their special teams impact. I mean, we have, yep. uh, obviously, it's something that's boring. It's not the defense. And it's really been an issue with the Broncos for years, it seems like. Uh, but if one of those guys can bring more on the special teams, whether it be punt or kickoff coverage slash uh, units, then that's probably going to be the dif- the difference maker between if those guys make the team. It's how you get your bones in the NFL. It's how you make your bones. It's how you ultimately get a starting position. Uh <laughs> Who is more loved right now other than Drew Locke? I'd say Justin Simmons in Broncos country right now. And how did Justin Simmons' career start? Starts blocking PATs and field goals and doing all these things on special teams. So you look at some of these players that have come in in the mid to late rounds and it is their responsibility to fill their role on special teams. Another reason why you're being thrust into the game. Um, Special teams are tough. I get it. It's tough to talk about special teams. I will not talk about the kicker that much just because it's not fun. Um, McManus is cool. We can talk off field stuff with McManus, but it just is, it is what it is. But in terms of kickoff, I want kickoff coverage. I want punt coverage. Tom McMahon has got his hands full with making sure that these young group of rookies can contribute on the special teams because that's the expectation, Nick. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And one of the good things for the uh, Carl Bishop coming in a few times here. Carl, thank you so much. Thanks, um, Carl. But uh, the special teams is super important. That's how these guys got to make the team. And for the Broncos also, for the past few years, they've been getting these comp- compensatory picks. They had a bunch of picks from trading back and just trading players because they've been out of playoff contention pretty early in the season. They have a bunch of players on rookie contracts. They have had typically bigger rookie classes. So that 
in theory means that those special teams units, the depth of the team should be better. So we'll, we'll see if that comes to play out. I know that two years ago's draft was a little smaller because the Broncos did some trading around in order to get Drew Locke and that kind of ate up some of that draft capital, which I think it was worth it in the end. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll see. It's, Really, this is a put up or shut time for that. But the special teams coach as well. I mean, I, I'm surprised he survived this offseason. Yep. Yeah, I think this is it, man. I mean, he's he's got to figure it out. It's got to be one of those things. Go show me. Put it together, you know. And these young cats, there's no excuse. I mean, I talk about it. It's boring. But last year at training camp, first drill I saw was the guys tackling bags and wrapping up from their knees. So Fangio's teaching the fundamentals because he expects that to happen. You cover punts. You cover kickoffs. You do not allow Tyreek Hill to score on special teams. He's already going to score on offense. You can't stop that. But you cannot let the Kansas City Chiefs eat you up in the special teams because that's what they've been doing. I mean, and it's been a little while, I think, since the Broncos have had a, a, a special teams touchdown of their own, right? I mean, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I can't think of one off the top of my head either. Chad, if you can remember one, I think there maybe was a – How long has it been? I def, I can think of the, the blocked extra point or the blocked field goal against the Saints. That would have been four years ago. When Simmons was a rookie, right? Yeah, Simmons and Will Parks kind of tag teamed that one. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, they, but, uh, and they illegally, what is now illegally jumping over the center, I think is how uh, yes. they should call that the Simmons rule. <laughs> well, Simmons is quite an athlete, so it uh, definitely works in that regard. But, uh, yeah, that's the one I can think of last. Maybe even a uh, a blocked punt? I can't think of any off the top of my head. So that is uh, yeah, unfortunate. I mean, and also they just have been struggling in regards to they've been giving them up. But part of that also is David Tubes, an incredible special teams coach. Andy Reid surrounds himself with good coaches. And they have Tyreek Hill. I mean, let's just – when you have Tyreek Hill, it's kind of like when they had Dante Hall. You're going to get some when you have the fastest player in the Oh, game. Dante Hall. He still That name still haunts me and makes me mad. I mean, that guy yeah. that guy was an absolute freak. I mean, I don't think he ever gets the credit that he, he deserves because I couldn't – his life. Yeah, I couldn't. Oh, it's special teams. He's like that Devin Hester. You know, they do that one thing and they do that one thing very exceptionally well. Uh, but their position, they're that athlete on the field that you need. Uh, not quite the football player, but the athlete on the special teams unit. So, you know, the Broncos, they're hoping they can get that with KJ Hamler, but you and I have talked about it. We caution folks on that. He's never scored a touchdown in, in college. So, on the special teams unit. So I think to immediately expect the rookie's going to come in and one field the punt, which always makes me nervous. I, I mean, I've how many times in, you know, the last few years have we seen muff punts from, from Broncos guys that are trying to catch the ball and drop it and everything else. I mean, my, my heart is in my throat. Anytime a Broncos receiver that wasn't named Emmanuel Sanders was back there because I at least knew that he was going to catch the ball the few times that he was in. So special teams, these guys got to come out. If they want to get a job, Play special teams, plain and simple. Yeah, and actually, good job, one. I was actually going to bring up that one. CC, don't know, uh, don't recognize you, but good to see you around here. Good to CC you. Uh, I can see Tyree Cleveland making a name for himself next season. It was a very good gunner and can return. I mean, that's why the Broncos yep. drafted him with the second to last pick in the seventh round. He's a height, weight, speed guy. And even if he never takes a snap as a wide receiver, if he can come in and be a great gunner and a special teams guy, there's value to that. That's a seventh round type of value. So, I mean, I think he was a five-star recruit for Florida too. So that athleticism has always been there. Uh, but I mean, it'll be interesting to see if he can make the team because of that. I think it's more likely, especially because of a weird off season and the expanded uh, practice squads that you will see Tyree Cleveland move to the practice squad this year for the Broncos and not be poached. Uh, but I mean, if he makes a name for himself, then the, that, that, that is what it is. Uh, Charlie Beagle, also commenter, he'll need a raincoat fund too, as well as the latte fund. I just got a raincoat today. I think Columbia had a super sale, so uh, the wife took care of that. God bless the wife. <laughs> yeah, she's got to put up with you. I mean, God bless oh her. God. Yeah, no, that's, and that's his own thing. Yeah, she's got her chores. So, uh, yeah, no, man, it, it's it's I, for me in, in trying to switch back to the offensive line a little bit. One thing that's really bothered me, and I wanted to get to it immediately, was do not move Dalton Reisner. Let's not do that. Let's stop the conversation right now because nobody's hurt yet. 
knock on wood, trying not to make sure that anybody's going to get hurt in the NFL is like thinking hope's a strategy, right? It, it just doesn't work. These guys are going to get hurt, but until it's broke, don't fix it. I like Dalton Reisner at the left guard position. Why? Because he's going to be working with Lloyd Cushenberry, your rookie starting center. Projected. That's what we all have penciled in. Um, then you've got Graham Glasgow that can also play center at the right guard position. So you've got your interior figured out. Um, Bowles is what he is on the left tackle. Don't know if Wilkinson's going to be competing there. Something we're hoping to see. But if you could get Dotson or Wilkinson in at the right tackle position, that's really what we're looking at. Do not move Dalton Reisner to the left tackle. I hear you. Those of you saying he can play right tackle because he did in college, I hear you. He can play right guard. He can play center. Heck, I think he could play four out of the five. I don't think he can play left tackle. I don't think he has that quick um kick step that left kick step that he really really needs he operates in that phone booth very well at guard he was able to bully some guys in college in kansas state with that program there but i I don't like him at left tackle um i hate that take it's been driving me nuts for the last few days i understand why people are saying it but for the love of god do not move dalton reisner to left tackle don't move him at all you're talking about taking a guy to putting him at, I think, at either tackle position, but making him maybe a C minus level player and yes. moving him from a B plus level player at guard. So exactly. I, I think you're hurting everybody there when you're doing that. Um, so I'm not about that. I think it's a lot of people doing mental gymnastics because they are in love with the how they perceive and the potential of Natane Muti. So they're like, oh, the sixth round pick who was could have been the best guard in the class if he was healthy, but he has just a horrifying list of injuries. Not just how frequent they are, but how severe they are. But with Glasgow's contract, with drafting Cushenberry, with Reisner here, where is Muti play? He's a lottery ticket. I mean, if he plays and you know he's good enough to play and healthy, then that's a good problem to have. Then you deal with that when that time comes. But I mean, there's probably an equal chance that we never see him. Like, honestly, because the injuries he had have been horrible. And we saw what happened to Clady after the Liz Frank injury. And he's had a Liz Frank injury on top of that or on top of other injuries. So yeah. we'll see. But I agree with you. I think if, if the push comes to shove, you could put Reisner at right tackle. But it kind of be more like that uh, Luis Vasquez situation where they put mm-hmm. him at right tackle just because they had so many injuries. And it did not look good. And it was kind of a disservice to that individual player as well. But sometimes the injuries happen and, you know, you just got to deal with it. Uh, but uh, I just don't think it's a position for him. I mean, also people say he played right tackle at Kansas State, but how many NFL edge rushers did he go against at Kansas State? I can think of one game, and that was against Kansas State, and Montez Sweat gave him issues. Not as many issues as the interior offensive line had for Kansas State against Jeffrey Simmons, who is an absolute tank and I yeah. love and is, gosh, I can't wait to watch him week one against the Broncos interior offensive line. Uh, knock on wood for week one. Uh, okay, but yeah. – uh, yeah, gosh. <laughs> I mean, I, I like players. I, I like my defensive linemen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that that's a take where people, I think, are trying to bend backwards to make room for Muti. And I don't yeah. – if Muti is good enough to play, then we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But that is – that's a ways off yet. Yeah, leave him where he's at. He's doing great. People are already projecting him to be a pro bowler. You know, uh, one of these guys that's eventually going to etch his name and there's a ring of famer 10 years down the road. That's what we all want to see. Don't ruin that. You know, don't ruin that. The guy came in and started 16 games as a rookie, second round draft pick. So while he gives a great interview, and for those of you who haven't heard Dalton Reisner speak, go listen to him. He gives a great interview, loves to talk to the media. I think he's got a career shown a lot of interest in the media um, after football, maybe switching gears there like a lot of athletes and NFL players do. Dalton Reisner saying that he's – taking snaps that he takes some sets at tackle and stuff like that. That's just who he is. Okay. That's who he is. That's not him being instructed by Mike Munchak to go out there and start preparing to play offensive tackle or center. If they're moving Glasgow and Kush to run. No, 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 no. You've got your left guard locked down. You just paid a right guard. You got your right guard locked down. You just drafted a center who is, seems to be very promising with potential, but still very raw. And there are going to be a lot of flaws, but you camouflage those with Reisner and Glasgow. And you and I have been hammering on it, and I think we're the really only ones. I know Chad touches on it, Eric touches on it a little bit, but here at Mile High Huddle, it feels like we're the only ones that are pumped to have Graham Glasgow. 
I mean, I think that he is you, – you want to talk about Dalton Reisner and some of Reisner's comments? Go listen to how he talks about Graham Glasgow. Dalton Reisner saying, I want to be Graham Glasgow. I want to be – I want to get his leadership. I want to know how to work in the offseason, how to prepare my body, how to you know, be physically – yeah, physically and mentally ready. Absolutely. And deservedly so. So I think, you know, John Elway's looking at this offensive line, trying to build it from the inside out right now. And man, tackles, let's just, let's give it a heck and see what happens. But to, to your point, real quick, Dalton Reisner um, at right tackle, wouldn't you already just have Elijah Wilkinson there? I mean, come on. Let's yeah. just already have them. It's it's already going to be a C ish performance anywhere. So why not leave that C performance on the right side and leave the A A plus at the left guard position intact? Yep, I agree with you there. And Glenn, haven't seen Nick's cup tonight. Did he already pack the brewskis? Uh, Glenn, I have been nursing an ulcer, so I am on an alcohol hiatus right now, or whatever is in my cups. Uh, sorry, Chad, <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely. Um, we got uh, also. Well, actually, it's Roberts real quick. Uh, can Morris do RT? Uh, Morris is absolutely tiny. The only position he could play is center. Like, he's just – he's tiny. So, he can't even play guard. <laughs> he's that small. But yeah, um, he's very very athletic, tiny. So, not playing right tackle. Uh, I would want to get a picture, honestly, of Dotson next to Morris because just absolutely six foot nine versus – Good athlete, Ooh. but stubby little guy. So, we got uh, Pabby coming in here. Uh, hey. You want to say anything here? Yeah, what's up, Abby? We appreciate your support so much. Guys, be sure to go ahead and check out all of our swag. we got some Mile High Insider swag going on right now. We've got T-shirts and hats. I just ordered my stuff today, Nick. I don't know if you've got your stuff yet, but I'm pumped to open up that stuff and, and check it out. Um, I'm waiting I until know. I have my official address in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. I know you're during the move and everything like that. But, no, pabby has got some gear in route right now, so I know she's pumped to pumped to get it. Pumped to rep it, pumped to wear it. So, you guys, be sure to go ahead and get your swag on and check out all our stuff at Maha Huddle, including podcasts, writing. Uh, we've got tons of gear from face masks to coffee mugs to hats to shirts. We've got so much content, Nick. It feels like anytime I'm going to the website just to see what's going on, I've got five or six things I need to look at. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. We've got an awesome staff. So, definitely want to check in with you guys and say thank you for rocking with us here on Saturday night. And Terry, Nick's Latte Fund, I appreciate you. I won't lie to you. I, I'm <laughs> a dairy guy at heart, so I black coffee is fine, but I'd prefer a little creamer in there, and lattes are pretty darn good if I uh, am willing to spend on it. So I do Latte. miss you. Yeah, lattes are, lattes are pretty darn good. So we got Dom uh, coming in here. Great podcast guy. It's, uh, Dom, I like your uh, artwork there. It looks like you did it yourself, maybe. Uh, Nick's nice Pepto Fund. Um, that's been, <laughs> nice work, James. I love Nick's, it. That was really Nick's, good. Nick's a Meprazole fund. That's been the go-to, which has been helping, but I'm still taking it a little easy. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm doing better, guys. That's that's good. But um, we got Reisner is a dancing bear. Learned that from Eric last night. I just don't know if he has the length and the foot speed that I would categorize as a dancing bear. Maybe a dancing panda bear. But you're looking, I'm looking for a Kodiak grizzly out there. Uh, I so I don't like that term, the dancing bear. To me, that seems goofy, and Reisner's not goofy. Um I don't like that term. I know where Eric's trying to go with it, you know, because he's everybody loves a bit dancing bear, right? Well, everybody loves Dalton Reisner. Um, in terms of his play, I, I don't quite agree with that. I think why he's a nice guy on the field, I think he's probably mean as hell on the field. Uh, I don't see him ever helping anybody up, even his own teammates. So that's exactly what I want in my offensive lineman. I want the nasties. I want the mean dudes. Um, I don't want the dudes that are wearing arm sleeves and visors and have eye black on wondering why they're getting holding calls. Yeah. Good, good call there. Um, here's a good question for you. Actually, we got Darian P come in. Good to see you, Darian. Um, how much media coverage is there at the training camps due to everything going on? Yeah, this is tough right now. This is really tough. So essentially what they're doing is um, they call it Olympic pool style reporting, meaning that X amount of media are allowed in at specific times. Now, X amount of media does have to go through the exact same protocols that all the players do. So um, it, it's something that has been very restrictive right now. Uh, a lot of places are still waiting to hear from the Broncos. Um, I know major radio outlets are waiting to hear from the Broncos. And right now, the Zoom press conferences are the uh, most preferred 
thing that the Broncos want for the media right now, just because they can't risk anything. I mean, they've got camp going on right now. And, you know, while that can be a little bit frustrating for the fan base and some of us in the media, we have to understand if we want football back, we just have to adapt adapt and overcome. And that's something that we're all willing to do. Um, but yeah, I think Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it August 12th? That's when football is actually going to get going in training camp. I think that's the big day. So um, get ready to see some re- reporters out there. And then you're seeing other reporters like James Palmer, who's going to be strictly out of Tampa Bay doing Tom Brady watch for the next couple of weeks. So you're going to have a very limited access of media right now. And uh it's going to be tough, but you know what? Say what you want about them. You've got a couple of really good cats out there always in Mike Kliss and Jeff Legwald. Um, can't say enough good things about those guys. My guys, Cecil Lamy and all those guys at the fan, huge friends of the show. And please go back and listen. Nick was on with uh, Ryan and Benjamin Albright on Broncos Country tonight this last week. And got to give them a plug as well because we've got excellent support from – KOA, the fan, uh, Mile High Huddle Sports Illustrated is just growing and getting better. And we just have to ride these times out right now. The media coverage, it's it's limited. That's that's all I can say. It's limited. Uh, it seems like guys are going to be rotating in and out. And not all those guys and gals have been named just yet on who's going to be over there. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. I mean, it's not just the players that are having to have a an odd season this year due to everything. But, guys, we're going to get out of here pretty darn soon. Obviously, some station identification. This is the Mile High Insiders podcast. Find us on Twitter here at MHI underscore football pod. Also, just the, the umbrella of our entire work here, Mile High Huddle. Go there. See what's going on. See what everybody's writing about. See our audio content. Uh, then probably the most important thing for you guys, if you enjoy what we're doing here today, subscribe, like, and share, uh, drop a like or a heart on Facebook also. But if, for YouTube guys, if you're listening right now and you're not subscribed, go ahead and do that, man. Then, then you, when our shows come up, you'll get a notification and you'll be right along with us. So it'll let you know when we are about to go live. Um, so I see they're talking about poutine in, uh, in the chat here. Have you ever had poutine, Luke? What is it? Poutine. I don't, I don't think I have. No. What is that? Oh, man, it is very good. I think I saw James describing it here. Um, fries oh, slash chips, uh, gravy I know, and I, cheese. I know how to – it's called Putin. That's the it's pre- Cana- president of it's, Russia. It's Canadian. It's Canadian. Yeah. I have had that. Um, quick story. I've been to Canada a couple of times in Newfoundland, and uh, they had – I guess it, it's, it almost felt like a Thanksgiving dinner where all the fishermen would go away. The families would have kind of a big celebratory meal before they would leave and when they'd come back. And I specifically remember that. That's crazy. I appreciate that comment. Putin, no, it's, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's Putin. Like they say – they call it Putin. And with the with a little bit of that Canadian – wonderful flair that accent on the end that i'm probably just butchering well i'll have to check that out uh, i had someone last time i was in the seattle area up in port angeles and that was probably the last time i had it and it was pretty darn good i could see vancouver across the way uh so also port angeles uh birth city of john elway so uh, chris hernandez coming <laughs> in here uh hashtag a thumbs, up. Little thumbs up chris we appreciate you he's having a hashtag chris's beer fund there Super Bowl's um, got so. that Super Bowl 50, Chris, in the glass there. I love it, Chris. Absolutely love it. So, yeah, no, we're going to be getting out of here pretty soon. Luke, anything on your mind that you want to talk about before we can wrap everything up and uh, get on get on with it and let our listeners get on with everything they have going the rest of their fine Saturday evening? Yeah, just a quick recap. I think the Broncos PR should be over the moon with the way that their team and their players have handled the interviews this week. I mean, my goodness, it's been um, writing slash analyst gold. I mean, every single day, it seems like we've got a quote to write up and a story to write up. And we're not just pulling these narratives, folks. These guys, Justin Simmons, Dalton Reisner, I mean, Vaughn Miller. My Lord, you want to hear a great interview, go listen to Vaughn Miller and the way he talked this past week. You know, I, I just absolutely loved uh, hearing these guys. I didn't feel like any of the um, questions to anything that were asked or any of the answers were insincere. I thought that these guys really spoke from the heart. They gave their honest feelings about how they, they feel about where they're at in training camp right now. I think sometimes you get the occasional company line here and there, but I mean – Man, the Broncos have a really impressive nucleus of young and veteran players. And it just, it gives me goosebumps to think like, you know, 
These these are bowling Broncos. These are guys Mr. B would want. You know, Justin Simmons is a guy Mr. B would want. Uh, Dalton Reisner, you know, Kareem Jackson. You look at these guys, just man. And Melvin Gordon. See Melvin Gordon in a Broncos uniform. It's weird. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. Um, especially seeing another 25 and then seeing AJ Bouye at number 21. So I'm trying to adjust to see some of these guys, Nick, when with the Broncos colors, because man, it feels a little weird, man. I'm used to that powder baby blue and screaming at the TV against Melvin Gordon. No more. Yeah, no, I mean, we'll have to get used to it. Obviously everything's going to, gosh, I hope we get used to it because that means we have some sort of normal season. And I guess before we get out of here and don't want to, not touch on it, but did you see my, I guess, postulation based on the Bronco or the, not just the Broncos, the NFL go into a sort of bubble situation in the I NFL did. this season, because obviously the NBA is doing a smash up job. I'm not a really big basketball fan, but they're doing a smash up job. Baseball is failing every step of the way. I mean, they're just, baseball is not doing well. And with football, with how many players they have, everything, it's not feasible to have one bubble, but what about having four separate bubbles? I did see that, and I think that was at your Twitter and get at Nick Kendall MHH. I did see that, and I liked it because it was it was something I hadn't really thought about. I mean, you, you think about throwing a bubble together for the NFL, and it's overwhelming, and it's like, how would this ever work? But they've got to be talking about that, right? I mean, they've got to – they. I don't know. It's, it's obviously not going to happen right now, but – you got to assume that things are being brought up, creative solutions and or creative ideas rather, because there is yet to be a solution. But it excited me, man, because yeah, it's tough for me to follow basketball right now too. We're so just enthralled with the ramp up period that training camp is in right now. And we're excited to get to August 12th, which is right around the corner. And then we're going to have some actual football to talk about. But uh, I liked it. I thought it was an interesting theory. One of the biggest things I liked about it was it was creative. It's out of the box, out of the bubble, in the bubble, if you will. Um, but you look at the NBA success rate and they're doing great. From, from what I can understand and from what I'm reading. Um, it's going to be tough with the fall coming because the fall has cold circumstances anyway. But I think you just got to take it day by day. I am encouraged by where the Broncos currently are at um, in terms of health right now, knock on wood. So uh, I liked it, Nick. I thought it was a great idea. I think right now in today's world, we need more ideas. We need more people to encourage other people to think about something else. And, you know, who knows? I would encourage people to go look at your Twitter and look at that idea of maybe getting some bubbles because that could spark a whole nother conversation for another person to think of an idea. You know, we got to have this conversation of, you know, building this world up. And I liked it a lot, man. Innovation. Innovation and this, even if it's a little wacky, it's weird times right now. It's wacky times. So uh, not so wacky. Patty coming in here. Thank you. You guys rock. Best wishes for Nick's move to Seattle. Oh, bless you for that. I am. I'm tired. I'm already. I, it's going to be fun. Hopefully we'll stop in like Yellowstone or the Tetons driving out there. Um, yeah, I'm sure the I will miss you. So I yeah, don't think we're going to top that, honestly. So Patty, we really do appreciate you. We're probably going to get on out of here. Luke, you're going to talk. Yeah, no, Patty. I, uh, I'm pumped to see your gear. Guys, and, and send us those pictures and stuff as you get your stuff. Um, I got my hat today, and I know Chad hadn't even seen it yet, a Mile High Huddle hat. Uh, it was the Trucker Edition hat that was just released, embroidered, really, really clean. So absolutely love it. Huge thanks to the boss man at Chad Jensen for that. Um, and be sure to get out all our work, guys. I mean, I constantly harp on it. We've got guys and gals working right now, you know, across the world. we got Keith over there in Scotland, you know, and who's a new father typing up you know, stories in the middle of the night and early morning. We've got Lance from, you know, our own podcasts and our own staff writing with a newborn. We've got you moving. You're still writing and still doing podcasts. So we're just so addicted to football and Broncos here at Mile High Huddle, man. So I thank you guys for rolling with us. This was a blast. It feels good to be back with you, Nick. And uh, I love your, your Bronco stuff in the background, even if Peyton's going down. Yeah, well, you know what? The the bookshelf is very much like the Broncos 2015 defense where it's just keeping him, you know, he's still the head of the organization, but he, everything else is supporting him. So they haven't That's let a, him down yet. He's leaning on them first time ever, but they're supporting him. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad you appreciated that one. But guys, we appreciate the heck out of you. That's going to be it for us today. Uh, go find Luke on Twitter at Luke Patterson LP and find myself on Instagram on Twitter at Nick Kendall MHH. Make sure you go over to milehighhuddle.com and affiliate of sports illustrated. Also go to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and a comment. Uh, 
on YouTube, if you're listening right now and you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Sub- like, subscribe, and share. That does a lot for us. If you're on Facebook, guys, we see you too. We appreciate you. Hit the like button. Hit the heart reaction. Well, does a lot for us and help. it can help us continue to bring you our Denver Bronco deep dives almost every single day. I, heck, every single day we bring your Denver Bronco deep dives. Uh, you can follow the Mile High Insiders podcast and all our other great audio content by subscribing to Huddle Up Podcast wherever you listen to your shows. Follow us on Twitter at Mile High Huddle and at MHI underscore football pod. Luke, what do you have going the rest of the night? I think I'm going to kick back with some friends. I want to talk some more football, actually. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I can't get away from it. I've got, uh, some neighbors I know that want to knock a couple cold pops back and, and talk football. Um, I'm going to bug a couple of my guys, see if I could get any insight to how things are going over there and hopefully get a text back. If not, I'll just annoy them. But no, man, I'm just looking forward to spending some time with friends and family. Um, I know that it was probably a good break for you packing and everything. I know that you're really stressed right now. So just be well, man. Be well. Yeah. Be well, because yeah, because earlier earlier y'all Nick was being so grouchy to me, and now I finally got him being a little bit nicer. So no man, Nick, it feels good to be back with you, buddy. I know it's so awesome to mix up the staff and everything like that, but um, Maha Insiders get at us every Saturday night at six. Yeah, honestly, the biggest thing for me with this ulcer and the move and everything is I'm not having hashtag Nick's beer fund right now, but I'm also not having caffeine and coffee, and that is killing me. Uh-huh. I did not, I am I am coffee dependent at this point. And I need to, I'm feeling better, but I'm just trying to give myself two weeks before I'm dipping my toes in that. So we see a lot of people, um, who, there was one comment here. Uh, somebody, we missed your question. Really apologize about that. Hopefully we can get to it next week. Andy Rock Lovato, uh, believe from Kansas. So Andy, get it back to us on Tuesday. Carl, Carl would never miss a Kansas person's question. So uh, I, can, I promise <laughs> and, you that one. And yeah, and DM us and tweet us too. So we can get at you guys right away. We've always got our phones on us. Nick and yes. I are constantly, Carl, everybody in MHH are always on Twitter, always available. Get at us immediately. Yep, absolutely. Well, guys, eight o'clock here in Central Time, seven o'clock in God's Time, it's Mountain Time out there. So we appreciate you guys. Uh, really do uh, hope you see you next week. If you, again, if you love us, follow us on Twitter. We'll see you guys next week. I'll see you Tuesday. As always, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.